Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. I am excited to announce that the Iowa History 101 series will continue through the end of the year on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. There are a lot of great Iowa-based topics that will be addressed by returning and guest speakers, including presentations on Buxton, Iowa, Glendale Cemetery in Des Moines, the Great War, and many more. You can learn more about this series on our website at iowaculture.gov history. Please remember to sign up for each webinar that you would like to attend. And don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came, in, came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm happy to introduce our speaker, State Curator Leo Landis. Leo has his Bachelor's of Science in History from Iowa State University and a Master's of Arts in Historical Administration from Eastern Illinois University. He has completed all but his dissertation towards a PhD in History from Iowa, St from Iowa State University. His museum experience includes time at Living History Farms in Urbandale, Connor Prairie in Fishers, Indiana, and eight years as a curator at Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. He has also worked as a curator and director of education at Salisbury House in Des Moines. Now I'm happy to turn it over to Leo to begin the webinar. Well, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you again to everyone for joining us today. And today we are going to be talking about Iowa and the World War II experience from the perspective of Iowans, but also handling some of the big picture aspects of the war. And so just to start out again with some general timelines, you've got the uh, rise of fascism in Europe following World War I or the Great War. So Benito Mussolini comes to power in 1922. Uh, in Asia, Japan is becoming increasingly militaristic. Uh, Hitler had actually uh, become active in, in German politics before 1933, but uh, Japan invades Manchuria in 1931. Hitler uh, is appointed Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Italy uh, begins to expand colonially into Africa and so invades Ethiopia in 1935. The Spanish Civil War with Francisco Franco as the fascist leader there. Uh, again, leading to rise of dictators in, in Europe with uh, militaristic aims. And then 1937, Japan invades China, launching the second Chinese-Japanese War, the Sino-Japanese War. In 1938, German aggression into Europe, uh, especially Czechoslovakia, uh, raises alarm in Britain and France, Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, uh, negotiates with Hitler, uh, has a peace treaty or a non-aggression treaty uh, that he claims guarantees peace in our time. Meanwhile, a uh, couple a month and, and a few days later, uh, the German forces under Hitler's leadership uh, destroy Jewish business businesses in the Crystal Nacht uh, event, uh, shattered glass. Is what Crystal knocked is the night of, of raiding Jewish Jewish businesses. So you really see, though anti-Semitism had been part of the uh, Nazi programs, that you see those being launched uh, in a more systematic way. 1939, really, the war begins on September 1st when Germany in, invades Poland and had previously signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union and the agreement between Germany and the Soviet Union that had been signed in, in August was that they would divide up Poland, each getting the parts they wanted. And so you, Germany goes in with the idea that they don't have to worry about 
the Soviet Union. Uh, in <clears throat> bottom, uh, because France and England had signed a treaty with Poland, they then come in in September of 1939 against Germany. Uh, France doesn't have a military base that can stand up to the Germans, and so the, the low countries of Europe, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, they're steamrolled and, and France uh, surrenders in 1940, signing a peace with Germany. 1941, uh, you've got the siege of Leningrad where the Nazis, the Germans abandon their non-aggression pact, uh, do invade Russia uh, prior to that, but then lay siege to Leningrad and, and through that time more than a half million Russians will die uh, in, in Leningrad alone. The U.S. Uh, is trying to stay neutral, though, through things like the Lend-Lease Act, uh, supporting the Allies, especially Great Britain, and with the attack on Pearl Harbor of, of December 7th, uh, the U.S. joins the war, declares uh, war on Japan on December 8th. Then uh, Germany shortly declares war thereafter, and so the U.S. is all in. Uh, 1942, Japan has uh, taken control of the Philippines, what is today Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, U.S. forces really are, are uh, trying to just stabilize in the Pacific, and then uh, in 1942, the U.S. is, is really starting to set up uh, its European forces coming through North Africa. So uh, seeing forces stationed there, uh, as well as uh, in the Pacific. And what the U.S. then tries to do is develop that island hopping strategy uh, in the Pacific going from island to island. And so you start seeing battles uh, across the Coral Sea and, and the Battle of Midway. And that's the U.S. then looking to start to regain some of that territory that it, it had lost uh, going from island to island. And the term that historians often use is called island hopping. Uh, to take control of the Pacific again, 1943. Uh, the U.S. and British forces and their allies are able to invade Italy. And coming up through what the term is Europe's underbelly, uh, the uh, Soviet allies had, had really been wanting a, a front in France, uh, but that wasn't something that the British and the U.S. Uh, leadership and Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt felt was, was possible. And, and I think most of our listeners know and, and viewers know that the leadership on the U.S. side and the Allies side is going to be Franklin Roosevelt as president. Uh, Great Britain, it's Winston Churchill. And in the Soviet Union, it's Joseph Stalin. Uh, in the uh, Italy and Germany, you've got Mussolini and uh, Hitler, and then you've got uh, the Emperor uh, Tojo in, or the Emperor, excuse me, uh, in, in Japan. And then 1944, you finally do see that front on the European uh, front with the D-Day invasion at Normandy. Uh, and by August 20th of 1945 through uh, August 25th, the Allied troops are, are in Paris. And then 1945, uh, though things had really started to turn in 1944, you do see then the uh, war really going the Allies' way entirely with uh, Iwo Jima, famous photograph we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, that battle is February 2nd, where U.S. victory is, is nearly guaranteed on Iwo Jima. Uh, you've got victory in Europe, VE Day, on May 8th. And then August 6th and 8th, you have the atomic bombs dropped in Japan, August 15th, is Victory in Japan Day with September 2nd, Japan formally surrenders. So those, those are some of your key dates there. Sorry to bog you down. And just some numbers to look at. Uh, from an Iowa perspective, we had just over 8,000 men die in service, 8,398. And uh, we're privileged to be able to tell some of those stories with our collection. We'll talk about that later. And then there were 800,000, 882,000 
542 men who had registered via selective service. Uh, of total service then, 262,638 Iowa women serve in some branch of the armed forces. Women can serve uh, as nurses, but also in their own corps. And so you've got the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, the WACs, uh, the Women Air Force Service Pilots, the WASPs, the Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service, the WAVES. So uh, the first two are on the Army side. The next one is the Navy and then the Coast Guard. Uh, group, they're called the SPARS, and it comes from their motto, uh, and I'm going to blank on the, what the P is, but it's uh, simper uh, something and then always ready. So they take the Latin words uh, SP and then the English translation of always ready, and so the Coast Guard's Women's, women's Reserve is called the SPARS. Uh, in 1940, just before the war, we had uh, 212,318 farms in Iowa with a production value just over of a half million dollars. In 1945, uh, we have 208,934 farms in Iowa. Uh, and the war effort, looking at the production value, it more than uh, doubles. And so is 1.2 uh, plus billion dollars in production. And just from a military uh, sacrifice standpoint. In military service, you can see the Axis numbers of death uh, in the U.S. and the Allies. You've got the military deaths there. Uh, it really is worth noting the number of Russians, Soviets, who die uh, in, in the war effort, uh, both military and civilian. Uh, you know, as, as much trouble as the Soviet Union uh, caused after the war and, and the, the country of Russia continues to cause for, for our country, the sacrifice of the Soviet people was just astounding. Uh, the sacrifice of the U.S. and, and the United Kingdom also was, was monumental. But look at those numbers, 24 million military and civilian deaths estimated uh, by the Russians, whereas in the U.S. and the United Kingdom uh, were just around a million total combined. And I think I have those numbers right from the U.S. World War II Museum. So that's some background on service. Uh, of course, service at home, we're going to talk about as well. And uh, just wanted to show, here's a, a shot of the German invasion of Poland, 1939 from the Associated Press. Uh, it really was the, the term Blitzkrieg uh, is one most, most people know, Blitzkrieg, lightning war. Uh, the Germans had built an incredibly mobile fighting force and did. They just steamrolled through Poland uh, into uh, the nations that are considered the low countries, Belgium, Netherlands of, of Europe, and then into France. And, and France really didn't stand a chance. It wasn't that uh, the French weren't good soldiers. It was just the, the Germans had built up such a strong military with uh, tanks that could move quicker than they did in World War II with airplanes and with motorized vehicles. And so uh, the Blitzkrieg just stuns uh, Europe. And so while the fighting is going on through 1939, late 1939 and early and through 1940, uh, there is a whole debate in the United States about trying to stay out of war. The memory of World War I or the Great War is still very fresh. <clears throat> but uh, as Japanese aggression in the Pacific is becoming uh, more active. And then the US, as I mentioned, the Lend-Lease Act, where uh, we aren't actively engaged in the war, but we will supply the British with ships and uh, supplies for the war effort. Uh, the US is engaged in the war effort for the Allies before 1941. Uh, or through 1940 and 1941 through things like the Lend-Lease Act. And so when uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor takes place, most Iowans learn about it through radio, uh, but uh, newspapers like the Ottumwa Courier do print an extra edition on, on December 7th for uh, their readers to highlight 
And so many Iowans were going to be uh, listening to the radio all, all day on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, and, and perhaps purchasing newspapers to learn about what had just happened. And actually, Iowans were gearing up for the war effort, as we said. Ed Sundholm uh, was a farmer near Albert City, and the Library of Congress uh, sent some of the uh, Farm Service Administration photographers who were going across the country as part of the work in the Great Depression uh, up to his farm. He had converted his dairy farm uh, that he was getting ready to update uh, into a uh, war production facility. And so this is a photo from the Library of Congress that then appears in the May 24th, 1942 Des Moines Register. And so on the upper uh, left is that same photograph. And these are some of the women working at the factory in, in kind of Northwest uh, Iowa, not kind of Northwest, Albert City is Northwest Iowa. And so, uh, you know, a little, little uh, about another two hours or hour and a half from Fort Dodge to the North and West in a bit of a diagonal. Uh, and so <clears throat> here you see an Iowa farmer who has converted his dairy farm shortly, and, and he had talked about gearing up even before seeing that there were contracts out there in 1941 for businesses to engage in war production. So uh, he is ready to go and, and the Des Moines Sunday Register can do this story on him, you know, uh, just five, five months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, he is, you know, in full scale war production. And so uh, he's got about 150 workers, he hopes that are gonna be uh, working on his plant. Uh, and so you've got women already engaged in war production uh, by early 1942. So uh, really compelling story of, of how Iowans are ready to, to get involved in the war effort already. And Another great shot, this is, this is a set of shots actually. This is the roundhouse, which is the maintenance facility used for railroad work. It was where, you know, any uh, station, station that did maintenance repair on uh, locomotives primarily would have a roundhouse and it, a roundhouse would have a large turntable for uh, moving engines around, but it was a place where maintenance could be done on the locomotives, the engines. And so uh, you see these women workers in 1943 uh, in Clinton at the Chicago and Northwestern Roundhouse. Uh, there is one gentleman in the back of the lunch photo on the, the back left there. Uh, a wiper is the lowest category of a worker at a roundhouse. Uh, <clears throat> you'd have, uh, you know, various levels of, of experience. And so the wipers were in charge of cleaning the working elements on the locomotive inside and out and, and just in general. So you see the uh, woman on the left, she's spraying down and would be cleaning off uh, the drive rods and other moving components of the locomotive to reduce wear. So that's, that's what the term wiper means. So a really great shot from the Library of Congress uh, the clock shows that it's about 12.10 uh, as they're eating lunch there. And Iowa youth were also engaged in helping with the war effort. Home produce, Victory Gardens had been part of the World War I or the Great War experience, but not as significant because we were really only in World War I for about a year and a half. World War II, we don't know how long it's going to last, but uh, that experience in the Great War had let the federal government know how to engage the public in supporting the war effort. So besides working, it was encouraging youth. And here's an announcement from the Waterloo Evening Courier from 1942. Uh, some young women who have won uh, $25 war bonds from the... Uh, Sears and Roebuck Company of Chicago. And uh, one of the women mentioned there in the second paragraph is Jean Peters, aged 17 of Gallery. Well, that image on the right is one of the canned goods that young Ms. Peters produced for that contest and is in the collection of the State Museum. So uh, 
we have some of the collections from this group of, of women, or we have some of the items that one of the young women who was a winner in this contest received. So uh, that's, that's why that picture of the canned goods are there. So young people are doing everything they can. It's part of the 4-H work of this group and <clears throat> done across the country. Uh, so young people, high school age, are working on farms, helping out, uh, but also doing uh, their own own work on behalf of the war effort. And the Junior Red Cross was actually an organization that again goes back to World War One, and so World War Two Junior Red Crosses are again mobilized. Uh, this is a, a group from Des Moines. You can see on the crate there that they're packing children's sweaters uh, for war relief, but children were also, you know, collecting scrap. Uh, young people were uh, gathering uh, things like uh, milkweed pod fluff that could be used uh, in creating uh, life vests. So people of all ages, this, this threat from a global desire of global domination from the Germans and the Japanese uh, really was perceived as a, as a, you know, existential threat to freedom across the globe. And so people of all ages were engaged in the war effort. And on the US and Iowa side, two of the better known uh, production facilities, besides uh, referencing those like Ed Sundholm, who are the smaller manufacturers. We had a major ordnance plant in Burlington uh, or in the Burlington area and so uh, setting up temporary housing uh, in trailers for families. So uh, you see I think it's the the Barker family who's there on the right uh, but some nice Library of Congress photos of what the housing was like for the workers at the the Burlington plant and so producing millions of, of shells and ordnance for the war effort down, down in Southeast Iowa. So a good shot there. And then the other one that's, that's well known is the ordnance plant just north of Des Moines uh, at Ankeny area. And so uh, a couple of stories and an ad, a, a story and an advertisement, I should say, uh, from the Des Moines Register uh, recognizing uh, in late 1943, the good work being done at the ordnance plant in Ankeny. And also, I, I really liked that advertisement on November 12th, 1944. You know, we've retaken Paris and D-Day has been five months and a few days before that. So the war in Europe is going well, but just reminding people that the war is not over, we still need workers. And so women uh, and men across the state are joining the war effort in these factories across the state. And as we said, some of the, the better known examples are, are the factory down in Southeast Iowa near Burlington and also uh, the plant, I should say, and the plant uh, near what is today Ankeny, Iowa. So those are two of the better known uh, plants, but there are, there's, there's factories and towns and council bluffs that are making parts. You've got the Collins uh, radio plant up in Cedar Rapids that's making communication devices. So everybody all across the state is engaged in the war effort. And some of the compelling stories I, I like to think about with Iowans, uh, Bob Feller, uh, premier pitcher in Major League Baseball. He had gone to the majors uh, as a teenager. He's from Van Meter, so just west of Des Moines uh, over in Madison County. And this is a case where athletes recognize the importance, or at least in Bob Feller's case, he's regarded as the first Major League Baseball player. And because he is such a significant baseball player. He signs up in fairly early 1942 and he does. He serves as a gunner on a, uh, the USS Alabama. So he is not someone who's staying stateside and, and serving. He is actively involved in the war effort and putting his life at risk. And 
you know, he's had by even in 1930s, 1940s standards, you know, a, a challenging uh, childhood, but is you know, reached a level of comfort as an athlete, though not much, not, not to the level that athletes have today, but he was, you know, one of the better paid baseball players and regarded as one of the best baseball players at the time. And, you know, uh, about four months after, four and a half months after uh, the attack at Pearl Harbor, he has enlisted in the Navy. So uh, the story of Bob Feller uh, is, is one to uh, inspire us and, and is really a compelling one. And he later donated some of his uh, Major League Baseball material to the State Museum. So we have a, a small collection of Feller material in our collection. Uh, another set of materials we have in talking about uh, people who served early and signed up early. You see the registration card on the right for James B. or Braddy Morris Jr. He went by Brad because his father's name was also James. And he's from Des Moines, but had been born in Washington, DC. You can see he's actually a, a bit of a World War I baby. His father uh, was an officer in the uh, group that trained at Fort Des Moines as an African American officer. And so uh, shortly, probably before uh, his father went to France, uh, and actually while his father, I believe, was still in France, James B. is, is, is born uh, because he's born on February 7th, 1919. And I don't believe his, his father had recovered from a war injury and had been brought, brought back uh, in early 1919. So uh, it's now 1942, 1943, and, and James, or Brad, I'll call him Brad Morris, uh, signs up for the uh, uh, military he ends up being in military intelligence. Uh, he earns the bronze star. So that's his bronze star on the left and his dog tags, which he wrapped in uh, medical tape, uh, likely to keep from chafing and also from, from making noise when he was wearing them. Uh, and his son, Robert, had, had donated both some of his uh, grandfather's things from World War I, but donated these to us uh, before Robert uh, passed away untimely a few years back. And, and so you've got African-American men from Iowa serving on behalf of our state. And uh, you can see on the back of his uh, registration card, James B was uh, 5'9 and about 170 pounds. And he signs up when he's at uh, the University of Iowa. And it's actually, again, a case before the war, selective service is underway. And so he registers on October 16th, 1940, but I don't believe he, uh, serves in the Pacific and gets called up till 42, uh, 1943, and he was was in military intelligence. Uh, there's there's some good research to indicate that uh, he may have been one of the first African American officers to uh, oversee because it was a military intelligence unit. Uh, he also uh, oversaw some uh, uh, people with European ancestry, so what would be classified as white people. Uh, and, and Robert had done some research on that and was working on that before he died. Uh, in addition to service from men, and a significant Iowa story is that Des Moines, Fort Des Moines, where African-American soldiers had been trained officers in World War I, uh, was the site for all a, a number, not just African-American women, but uh, a number of women, I think more than 50,000 women ended up training at Fort Des Moines uh, and here you see the third platoon, Company One. Uh, again, the, the men and women's military is segregated through World War II. And so uh, the women reported to Fort Des Moines uh, in mid or actually early summer of 1942 and are training there all through the war. Uh, classes would be trained and then discharged and a new class would come in. So this is the, the third platoon, Company One. Uh, at Fort Des Moines. So just on the kind of southeast of downtown Des Moines uh, on Army Post Road is Fort Des Moines and the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, the WACs, uh, were trained. Many of them were trained here in, in Des Moines. And a lesser known story and, and one that I've just learned in the last few years was the story of the waves training at Bartlett Hall up at what was then Iowa State Teachers College but is today the University of Northern Iowa. So uh, the first place that trained 
some of the women to serve as waves, uh, the women in volunteer service for the Navy, and then the spars for the Coast Guard were being trained uh, at Bartlett Hall at Iowa State Teachers College. And we've got a great collection and my colleague, Sharon Avery uh, was kind enough to uh, pull some boxes for me. And I had a chance to look through some of our materials related to the, the waves. So they had their own little magazine that they had printed or a newsletter called the Iowa Wave or the Iowa Wave. And uh, they were promoted in uh, local newspapers and uh, recruiting uh, materials also in the collection. So uh, if somebody's ever looking for uh, like a good research topic, uh, University of Northern Iowa has great collections connected to them too, but we've got uh, a nice, nice little selection here in Des Moines. And so thanks to my colleague, Sharon Avery. Uh, and, and again, this is an important first group of women uh, report late 1942. They train at Bartlett Hall and it is, it's the first site for uh, women's service for the Navy is, is at Cedar Falls. And you can see, I, I wondered to myself, uh, this is one of the booklets, did any Iowa women serve in the spars? And I, that's on the side on the right of your screen. Uh, and there's at least two women, uh, Mary Ann Moore from Des Moines. And uh, I know there's one more on the list, I think of spars, but maybe I'm, I'm misremembering. Uh, but there are some women serving in the, oh yeah, there's uh, Adele Potter of Dubuque on the right column in the P's. So uh, at least two women in this group of, of spars from Iowa. And you can see some of the women who served in the waves on the left in this, this magazine or booklet. Among the stories of sacrifice that are well known, of course, is, is, is the Sullivan brothers from Waterloo. And they were all on the USS Juno. Uh, the US Juno, SS Juno was, was uh, hit uh, in the South Pacific and all five were lost. A couple are believed to have survived the initial attack and the sinking, uh, ultimate sinking, but then all five were lost. And so the Sullivan family of Waterloo is a well-known story. And we have a poster that was produced. We have multiple examples of this, but the, the Sullivans were then used to uh, promote everyone pitching in. And so recognizing the Sullivan brothers of, of Waterloo is, is, you know, a story a lot of Iowans know, but didn't want to overlook them today. Uh, but also didn't want to overlook women who, who died in service. So here's an example of a young woman who was serving in the waves. So she had trained at Cedar Falls and Julia Oliver of Des Moines, and we have her jacket in our collection. She was stationed in San Francisco, Oakland area, became ill and died in service. And so we're honored to be able to share her story a little bit in our visible vault exhibit. Uh, my colleague Kay Coates, uh, our collections coordinator, uh, did a lot of good research on her. And so I, I learned her story through Kay and did a little more work on my own. But uh, here's an example of Somewhere over 500 women die in service to the United States and, and Julia Oliver uh, from Des Moines was one of those women. Another story similar uh, to the Sullivan, so many young men die on ships. This one is, is one in the Atlantic and M Merton Myers is believed to be, or is, is the first uh, man from Pocahontas County, Iowa, so Northwest Iowa, to die in service. He was uh, serving. They had captured a German ship. He volunteered to board the German ship to do reconnaissance. He was a machinist mate first class. And when he boards the ship, the Germans had planted uh, explosives on the ship. And so uh, those go off as they're on the ship and he is killed in 1943, in March of 1943. 
and his family donated some of his apparel uh, that came back to them. And so uh, his is another story we tell in our visible vault exhibit and have his uniform currently on display in our collection. But all of these uh, photos that I'm using of uniforms, of course, you can you know, type in uh, Merton Myers on our collections database uh, portal and, and see a little bit more information too. And you can see the family was recognized uh, talking about his, his bravery and his uh, willingness to, to go beyond just regular service. And so uh, they actually did, there was a USS Sullivan named after the Sullivan brothers. There was a USS uh, Myers named after Merton Myers that was commissioned uh, later in the war as well. So while you have, and, and I don't want to diminish the, the uh, battles in North Africa and coming up through Italy and, and Sicily and Anzio uh, to do that. But uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move into 1944 with the D-Day invasion. And so uh, the U.S. forces are, are primarily at Utah and Omaha Beach at Normandy. And then you've got British and Canadian forces at Gold, Juneau, and Sword uh, Beach. And so this is June 6th, 1944. Uh, the British and US are finally able to open up that true second uh, Western front that the Joseph Stalin and the USSR had wanted us to, to engage. And so uh, you have that invasion taking place on June 6th, 1944. And a story connected to D-Day that is one, again, that I, I've recently learned. Uh, we have the pension application or the bonus application in, in our collection. It's been digitized by the uh, uh, Ancestry.com company, but this is a, an application done uh, in October of 1949 for uh, war service and the man is Francis Leon Sampson, Francis L. Sampson. And he was born in Cherokee in 1912. So he's a native Iowan. And if you look on the application, if you can see it on your screen, uh, it's about the third handwritten line down. Uh, he talks about where he's employed. He's employed at St. Patrick's Rectory. He was a priest. He had gone to Notre Dame. Uh, for his undergrad and then went to seminary in Minnesota and he signs up to be a chaplain and he's in the, uh, he's a paratrooper. And so he is at D-Day and that is a photo. I'm pretty sure it's from the uh, National Archives collection. I didn't find a good attribution on it and, and it's, it's such a tragic and compelling photo. It, it brings, you know, to light uh, the, the men who did die at D-Day. And so he was a chaplain who was giving last rites at D-Day. Uh, he serves all through the war, but also what he does at D-Day is <clears throat> there is a family from New York, the Neeland or the Nyland, N-I-L-A-N-D. And there are four boys, so one less than the uh, Sullivans of Waterloo. And the four Neeland boys, uh, two are killed at D-Day, and one is missing in action and believed dead in the South Pacific. And so Father Samson gets put in charge of leading the mission to find what is the fourth surviving brother. And it really is part of the impetus of the Saving Private Ryan story. Uh, it's based on this priest from Cherokee, uh, and he was serving at Neola, uh, Iowa, so just east of Council Bluffs a little ways uh, when, when the war started. Uh, he also taught school for a bit too. And so uh, the, he, he then, after the war, serves in the Air Force as a chaplain. Uh, I think he was a captain or a major during the war, uh, but then keeps rising in rank. And when he retires, he was actually a, a pastor down in Shenandoah for a number of years. So Southwest Iowans know him a little bit. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, here's a, a story that's not often well known uh, and, and really is, is part of the inspiration. Uh, I think Steven Spielberg did mention him in a speech once learning the story and how he was in charge of the, the mission to find uh, that fourth brother that, that helped inspire the story of Saving Private Ryan. So uh, Father or Monsignor Francis Sampson is a, a really uh, compelling story as well and someone who was serving at D-Day. Uh, jumping back to the Pacific again, and, and so many Iowans know the, the story of, uh, and I referenced the island hopping strategy to get uh, territory back in the South Pacific and then be able to uh, more uh, easily attack the Japanese uh, nation itself. Uh, and so the Battle at Iwo Jima and the uh, Rosenberg photograph of ra raising the flag uh, you know, in the last couple of years, it was identified that uh, Harold Keller of Brooklyn, his uh, formal name was Pi, or informal name, I should say, a nickname was Pi, uh, is one of those men. And so that's a, a story uh, that's just been verified in the last few years. The Iowa Gold Star Military Museum did a really nice event uh, in February of this year. The, the date was February 23rd of the uh, flag being planted there and uh, Mr. Keller's daughter is, is still alive and so uh, the Gold Star, Iowa Gold Star Military Museum did a nice event uh, around this and there's been some good good news stories about it too. Uh, so that's that's a story Iowans can can be proud of is, is Harold Keller of Brooklyn, Iowa's story and being one of the men at uh, Iwo Jima raising the United States flag. Back on the home front, uh, beginning in summer of 1943, uh, Algona is really the first big location, so north central Iowa, uh, Kasuth County, county seat, uh, becomes the site of a prisoner of war camp. Uh, instead of having US soldiers having to watch uh, prisoners of war in Europe and, and really not having the land or uh, ability, not wanting to use manpower to monitor uh, prisoners who could escape back to their units uh, when transport ships uh, were coming back uh, from bringing troops to Europe, well, uh, they would bring back prisoners of war. And so Algona becomes the site of a major prisoner of war camp. And initially they say it's going to be for Italian prisoners, and there were some Italian prisoners there, uh, but it was primarily German prisoners in the end. And so uh, Camp Algona uh, is, is still a well-known story in, among many Iowans, and especially North Central Iowans. And so uh, the prisoner of war camp at, at Camp Algona is, is well-known. Uh, one of the stories that uh, is connected to that is that some of the uh, prisoners uh, create a uh, set of uh, nativity figures from the Christian Christmas seen and so those are still uh, extant, still exist and uh, managed by the Methodist, one of the Methodist churches of Algona or the Methodist Church of Algona. So uh, hopefully as, as uh, things return to normal, maybe this, this Christmas you can get up to Algona and see uh, the nativity set done by the German prisoners of war. Also in Southwest Iowa, then you have uh, the Clorinda prisoner of war camp and there were Germans and Japanese prisoners there. Uh, we didn't have as many Japanese prisoners as we did capture German prisoners, but there were still a number of them. And so the uh, Des Moines Register did this feature on, on the prisoner of war camp at uh, Clorinda. And again, Iowans taking on different roles to manage and uh, support the war effort and as you can see uh, some of that meant uh, being the hosts of prisoners of war uh, some uh, really because of the the way the japanese were portrayed for having attacked pearl harbor uh, the language describing japanese is is you know uh, much more uh, uh, critical than than what you see sometimes of the the description of german prisoners and there were Italian prisoners, as I said, in, in Iowa. I know 
Uh, some of those were stationed in Johnson County in smaller camps and uh, would do work uh, across eastern Iowa. Uh, there was a military hospital in Clinton. And so uh, sometimes, again, the, the prisoners would either help out on farms or would help out in other activities. And uh, so uh, to contribute to the, the efforts at, on the home front uh, was something that the prisoners were, were often, especially the German and Italians, I think the, the Japanese were because of some of the uh, challenges. Uh, you know, there were a number of Iowans who were Italian, immigrants from Italy or who, whose parents were immigrants from Italy. So there are a number of Iowans who could speak Italian and there were certainly a number of Iowans who could speak German. There were not many Iowans who could speak Japanese and serve as translators. So uh, easier to use the European uh, prisoners as, as laborers because there were generally people who could translate for you. And so with the D-Day invasion, uh, you then, not even a year after that, uh, see VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. And so a, a story, and I'll move through these pretty quick, but there's the, the Carroll newspapers coverage. And here's the uh, Des Moines Tribune's uh, coverage of VE Day. And really the, the, while Americans were, and people in Iowa were, uh, excited by victory in Europe, there was still a lot of work to be done uh, as, you know, uh, talking about uh, the war effort. And so you do see uh, surrender being mentioned. Here's the Waterloo paper. And because uh, small town papers usually are published once a week, uh, usually on Thursdays, uh, the Haywarden, so far Northwest Iowa uh, paper talks about victory in Europe, but uh, you can see in the third column from the left or the right uh, that uh, it, the news in, in Haywarden was greeted solemnly is how it's described. Uh, tendency to celebrate was dampened by seriousness of job ahead. Stores and schools were closed and that was typical. Uh, there was kind of a, a day of service uh, and church services were held uh, at, at, in communities across the country and that there was a community uh, service at uh, uh, the school auditorium in Haywarden that night. So uh, very understated uh, celebrations across the state for VE Day. Uh, one of the other things that happens across the country though, and does affect Iowa, and it doesn't really make the newspapers until the war is over, but here you can see the Des Moines Tribune, August 15th, 1945. So. Uh, VJ Day has taken place and the Tribune, the afternoon paper in Des Moines, uh, runs the story on the Japanese balloon bombs that had been a strategy in late 1944, early 1945, that some did land in Iowa and we do have fragments of them in our collection here in Des Moines. Uh, they mostly, because of the air current coming over from Japan, mostly landed in Northwest Iowa. So around Holstein, uh, Lorenz and Pocahontas County. Uh, those are a couple of the, the locations. And no Iowans were killed. Uh, when uh, mother and child in Oregon were killed, it did make the national newspapers at the time. So uh, people were aware that this was going on, but there really had not been any uh, publication of any bombs landing in Iowa until after the war was over. And we do, we have uh, some fragments of one, uh, both the, the parachute was the upper photo. I'll see if I, yeah, there's the parachute fragment on the, or the balloon fragment, I should say, on the photo on the right. And there's some of the working mechanisms uh, that were uh, from, I think this is the Lorenz, uh, material though uh, the reference that we received when it came into the museum collection in the early 1970s still was pretty circumspect so uh, not entirely positive positive. and the other part of the war effort that the united that iowa plays a major role is the manhattan project the atomic bomb project and frank spedding was born in hamilton ontario canada uh, but had gone to University of Michigan. He's then hired uh, as a chemist at Iowa State, and he was one of the premier uh, 
scientists. And so uh, Fermi in Chicago uh, employs him to work half time in Chicago on the Manhattan Project at University of Chicago. And he also works half time in Ames. And Ames is the site with the uh, little Ankeny facility and today what is the Ames lab uh, component of the uh, Department of Energy facility at Iowa State. Uh, Spedding leads the uranium production for the United States for the most part. And so when the US is able to test uh, an atomic bomb using uranium, much of that came from Ames and then uh, what's used also for the uh, bomb on Hiroshima. Some of that was uh, a process developed at, at Iowa State. So the atomic bomb with Frank Spedding and the uh, little Ankeny facility is, is uh, an important story. And then as we wrap up uh, with the atomic bomb, uh, Paul Tibbetts was born in Illinois, the pilot of the Enola Gay, but his mother was Enola Gay Haggard of uh, Glidden, so uh, Green County. And so he named his plane after his mother's first and middle name, Enola Gay. So the plane uh, that dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan was named for an Iowan. And Paul actually lived in Davenport in, and Des Moines both. So strong Iowa connections with uh, the bomb uh, that's the first atomic bomb, the one dropped on Hiroshima or Hiroshima. And so with the uh, dropping of the bomb and uh, again, a devastating attack on a civilian facility and, and that's a, a story in itself. Uh, I, I had a friend whose father served in, in World War II and he was so grateful he was serving in the Pacific uh, that the war came to such a speedy end with, with the atomic bomb. Uh, so have a lot of respect for that service and the challenges that uh, those men were facing. But uh, with the two atomic bombs, with uh, Hiroshima and then Nagasaki, you've got VJ Day on August 15th, uh, a crowd celebrating in Des Moines, shown in Des Moines paper, and then uh, the signing of the uh, formal peace agreement on September 2nd, I believe, in 1945. Uh, on the USS Missouri. And so the war comes to a conclusion and uh, we are proud to share stories at the State Historical Museum. Our visible vault exhibit on the second floor of the museum has uh, a number of World War II uniforms. Uh, that's James B. Morris's uh, uniform there on the left. And I believe it's Hazel Neth uh, her uh, army nurse's uniform jacket there on, on the center and just uh, heard a new story this week of a man named Leonard Bradley. We don't have anything connected to him if there, anybody knows his family. Steve Hankin, who's a good historian from uh, Jones County area, told me this story. Uh, Mr. Bradley was serving in uh, the Pacific. He was in a foxhole, a grenade comes in, he puts his helmet over the grenade and steps on his helmet, hoping to absorb the shock and pre prevent his, uh, call his, his, his comrades from being injured, which he does prevent, but it, it destroys his foot. And so he has his foot amputated, but he earned the Distinguished Service Cross uh, for that, that work. And like so many Iowa men who are getting older and Iowa women who are getting older and we've lost so many of them, uh, those stories, uh, we're proud to preserve them at, at our museum, the Grout Museum in Waterloo. The Sullivan Brothers Museum is part of the Grout uh, Museum complex. Does a great job. The Gold Star Military Museum does a great job. And so would encourage you to seek out more stories. And with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up and, and say, open it up to questions, Matt. We've got about five minutes or a little more. Yeah, thank you, Leo. Uh, we, like you said, we have some time for some, uh, some questions now. So However, before I pose the first question, I wanna remind our participants here that you can still submit your questions to the Q&A feature. Like we said, we aren't scheduled though, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions before the end of the webinar. And here's our first question uh, for you, Leo. Um, and as we know, World War II occurs after the Great Depression. So in what ways did the Great Depression 
uh, impact U.S. involvement in World War II. You know, the, the Great Depression, we had had a number of government programs, uh, the Works Progress Administration and, and uh, other programs that had started to nationalize some of the uh, coordination of the United States industries. And so uh, some of those New Deal programs at least established a precedent for uh, coordinating activities across, across the country. And so many of the, the people who had grown up or uh, lived through the depression uh, saw just how uh, dire things were economically that I think that the effort then to support uh, democracies across the globe uh, compelled them to work harder. But really, we didn't come out of the Great Depression as a nation through the 1930s. It was really World War II that brought us out of the, the Great Depression. So. Uh, uh, the experience of the people who lived through the depression was profound. Uh, those are the people who did the service both overseas and on the home front to, to win the war. But uh, really, as a nation, we weren't brought out of the depression until World War II. And, and thank goodness we were successful. Perfect. So during World War I, there was an anti-German sentiment in Iowa. Uh, was there anything like that during World War II? Uh, a little bit, but not as much. And I think some of that was because uh, Iowans had seen the, you know, largely broad patriotism uh, of Iowans of German ancestry through the Great War. Uh, also, uh, while uh, the Kaiser in World War I was, uh, you know, militaristic, he was not even close to Hitler's level of evil and the genocidal uh, behavior that the Germans were engaged in. So Iowans with German ancestry had proved their patriotism in, in the Great War. And uh, while there was still, you know, concern of espionage and uh, concern about people of German and Italian ancestry. I mean, folks with Italian ancestry in Polk County, uh, we've got a great photograph, Becky Plunkett in our uh, special collections, I think uh, put it out there uh, through our Flickr or Facebook uh, pages of where the Italian, so of Des Moines had a patriotism flag to show how many Italians were serving. So uh, the, the concern was, was maybe a bit more about Italians. And because we didn't have a large Japanese uh, population in Iowa, that wasn't a concern, but we all know, or most people know, the internment of, of Japanese Americans and the tragedy that that, that was. And the US did apologize and, and give reparations to people of Japanese ancestry because of that. So uh, not as much as anti-Germanism in World War uh, II. Uh, this will be our last question, and I'm, I'm kind of putting together a few questions we received throughout the talk today that had to do with the factories. Uh, and one question was, is there a register of civil, civilian workers in these factories in Iowa? And within that, what was it like working there? And did immigrants work in these factories as well? Uh, immigrants certainly did. Uh, usually the days were 10 to 12 hour days. Uh, and, and so, and you know, often a six day work week. Uh, uh, so people working in the factories, you know, were putting in, while not putting their lives at risk to the degree that soldiers were, uh, certainly were sacrificing as well on the home front. To answer that first question is, is there a register of employees? That was up to the individual companies uh, to maintain. And so, uh, I know we have some of the Des Moines Yonkers store records uh, in the Des Moines collection. Uh, there may be some in Iowa City that, that uh, my colleague Mary Bennett knows about, uh, connected to war industries, uh, and, and some local historical agencies may have materials, or University of Iowa, or Iowa State, or UNI may have materials too. But there's no across the board registry of, of workers that I know of. Uh, in defense plants in Iowa, but that's a, a great question. Well, perfect. Well, thank you, Leo. And with that answer, this is all the time we have for today's webinar. I say this every single time and I keep repeating it. It's been a very informative lunch. I've learned a lot. Um, also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the upcoming Iowa History 101 webinars that will continue throughout the rest of the year. 
with the next one on September 10th. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. While you are there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as the Goalies Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story Series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again on September 10th. Thank you.